Good morning. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm listed in the um, brochure as a transformationist. And if you're expecting me to be grabbing a hat and pulling rabbits out of it, then that's not going to happen. Um, what is a transformationist and what is this thing that I'm calling societal transformation? You've got all these icons on your name tags and you've got all these uh, things that we've talked about in our world before. You know, peace, conflict resolution, environmentalism, sustainability. To me, societal transformation is the umbrella that covers all of that. It's the thing that we should be focusing our attention on right now. Um, I became uh, interested in societal transformation from a very, very early age. I started out in Camden, New Jersey, Time Magazine's worst city in America. There's no bragging rights from being from the second worst city in America, okay? Yeah, we're number one. And I was raised in the worst parts of the worst city in America. And from that beginning, from eight years old, I remember going, uh, my mother was moving us to yet another house in, in uh, Camden. And the landlord was there, and as I walked up, at eight years old, I could read pretty well, and I saw that big red sign that said, Condemned. And the landlord looked at me trying to read the fine print, and he ripped off the sign and said, Don't worry about it, kid. Well, I've been worried about it ever since. And it's not just for me, but it's for all of us on this planet. That all of us, in some way, shape, or form, are, are feeling the effects of needing a society that's in need of transformation. My, my travels have taken me around the world a number of times. And it's taken me to the island of Sri Lanka a number of times, where I work as senior advisor to an organization called Sarvodia. And while there, I have uh, gone to more refugee camps than I care to think about. I do that because someone needs to be witness to the conditions that are happening on this planet. So while I was there, I um, had, I, it was a very a depressing tour. And I was, I was telling my folks, I don't want to go to another refugee camp, they take me to another one. I don't want to go to another refugee, they take me to another one. And so, at one of the refugee camps, though, I saw this bright ray of sunshine, this little baby that just happened to be kind of bursting with energy. So I said to... Uh, through the tra my translator to the child, um, I thought the mother, said, I thought the baby was about six months old. So I said, how old's your baby? She said, she said baby's six months old, but this is not my baby. A shell landed on the, baby, on the house and killed the mother, killed all the siblings, and, and the baby was spared. She said, the baby's father is on another part of the island where there's fighting going on. And he may be dead, but if he's not, when he comes back home, he'll find his wife is dead, his children are dead, and the only thing he has in the world is this baby. And I felt that at that point in time, I failed her. Her name's Priya Darshini. I felt that not only did I fail her, I felt that all of us failed her that we don't have anything to offer in terms of a society where this doesn't happen to our children. 
not only are we failing these children, we're failing the children of all species. And I think that it's time for us to change that. That's why I think it's time for us to have some societal transformation. I think that we need to change not only our hearts, because a lot of us in this room have done personal growth and development work. I think we have to do more than change that. I think we have to change the systems and structures that cause these kinds of things to happen. Let me give you a quick rundown of what these systems and structures look like. I want to I point out a little bit of dysfunction to you. Okay, so this is our beautiful rainforest in the Amazon. We take the rainforest and we cut the trees down. We take the trees, we put them on ships, and we bring them into a paper processing plant. From the paper processing plant, we, we turn that into telephone books. And then we take the telephone books and put them right in a dumpster. Because none of us use telephone books anymore. This system that goes from the rainforest all the way to your dumpster is a system that is ecologically immoral. Now, I don't want to tell you what to do and how to do it. If you want a phone, new phone book every year, fine. You should ask for one, as opposed to the six that wind up in my doorstep. But, we do, but in order to change this system, think of all the people who will lose their jobs. Think of all the people who make their living, they make their money off of a system that makes no sense. At some point in time, someone has to take the big picture, has to stand back and say, let's rethink this. Do we really need to do these things this way? And that's my job. My job is to get us to ask us to, to, to look at the big pictures and to look at the big issues our big values. What are our values? What are the operative values of our time? I'd like to share with you that, our, that one of our oper operative values should be this notion that I call inclusivity. Now, inclusivity is not inclusion, inclusiveness, um, toleration, anything like that. Um, I actually happen to have it on good authority that I am intolerable. I've been told that before. <laughs> but inclusivity means is that I'm connected to you. I'm connected to you whether I know you or not. I'm connected to you whether I like you or not. I'm not trying to create a popularity contest. I'm trying to create a, a world where we're all living together as brothers and sisters. And if we do this, this world's gonna look a lot different than it does right now. So let me give you a, um, uh, something that happened here in Portland some years ago. Uh, I'm hired from time to time to um, uh, do inclusivity consulting with different organizations. I was hired by the city of Portland to work with their road workers. Uh, the Bureau of Maintenance, these are the, the, the bluest of the blue collar workers. And I was talking with them and doing this, this mandatory training with them to get them to recognize that they were part, an integral part of society. This is right around the time of the tensions that came around the uh, Rodney King beatings. And uh, after, in, in our second or third session, one of the workers told this story. This guy is a, a, a white uh, road worker. And he said he was driving around in uh, northeast Portland, and he uh, noticed that there was a car full of young black men behind him. And he said, I reached under the seat where I keep my loaded 45, just to be safe. And he says, as I was reaching for it, I remembered Sharif's training. And in my training, I said, do a transference. If that's a car carload of white kids, what would you do? He said, well, if it's a carload of white kids, I wouldn't be reaching for my gun. So he said, I left my gun where it was. 
So he said, you know, kind of travel on a couple more blocks. And at the next light, the car didn't go, stay behind him. It pulled alongside him. He said the passenger rolled down the, win the window, pointed an object at him, and pulled the trigger on a water gun. Doused him real good, laughed, and they sped off. And he said, if the gun was on my lap, I would have fired first. Think about Portland's reputation where white people gun down unarmed black teenagers. Think about how important inclusivity is to our lives. We've got to get this through all of our hot button issues. We've got to get over our progressivism and our conservatism and elevate the conversation to a whole new level. If I ask this room right now, I said, those of you who are for gay marriage stand over here, those of you who are against gay marriage stand over there, the room would polarize. If I asked you, everyone who's in favor of clean water, stand on this side, and everybody who likes drinking toxic water, stand on this side, I think that we'd have inclusivity. And we can do this on a number of issues that are more pertinent to how, our, how we live our lives than whether or not uh, one of our, 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 our key um, hot button issues are being pushed. We've got to pay attention to what's actually happening on our planet right now. We tend to pay attention to the stuff that is being uh, pushed at us by our media. But if we're going to save ourselves and our planet, if we're going to thrive on our planet, we've got to do things differently. So I want to ask you a question. Everybody here has heard about the events of September 11th, 2001. Everybody has had that drummed into their heads over and over and over again. It becomes a real event because the media makes it real. So I'm going to ask you, the audience, a question. I'm going to ask you to stand up if you know someone personally who was killed during the events of September 11th. That you know someone who was killed in the World Trade Center, you know someone who was killed at the Pentagon, so you know someone who was killed on Flight 11. If you know, that, know someone personally that was killed during September 11th, can you please stand up? Okay. That's about what I normally get in a group like this. Thank you. Now I'm going to talk to you about an issue that is not talked about in the media. If you, and that, and that is suicide, if you know someone who has committed suicide or seriously attempted suicide, and that someone can be yourself, but if you know someone personally who has committed or seriously attempted or considered suicide, can you please stand up? Thank you. This is an epidemic in this country and we don't talk about it. Because suicide is, is the, the, the marker for suicide is spiritual starvation. We live in a spiritually starved society and nobody wants to touch it. Nobody wants to talk about it. <clears throat> so we've got to get our, to our real issues and not just stick around on our hot button issues. I want to share with you, though, um, some, get away from the depressing stuff, and share with you some visions, uh, and actually meta-visions. A lot of you have a vision of your future, etc., but you, I, I want to share with you some, some larger, some bigger visions. My vision, we can create a world that works for all beings. If you don't like that, try William McDonough's. We can love all of the children of all species for all time. If that was the thing that motivated our society, we'd be living in a fundamentally different society. 
or take the vision of my friend Mark Anielski. We can create an economy of enduring happiness, an economy based on love, not money. Now, if you don't like mine, take one of those. And if you don't like those, come up with one of your own. We do have a current long-range plan right now. It's called, let's kill this planet. <laughs> now, no one says, I don't wake up in the morning and, I, and kill a planet. I don't want to do that. But uh, Stafford Beer says, the purpose of a system is what it does, not what you think it does or not what you say it does. And by the way, Stafford Beer uh, is not a Northwest microbrew. Uh, now, some of us engage in a slightly different uh, plan. Let's kill this planet slower. Okay, we call that the sustainability option. <laughs> Let's do all that we can to save the Earth, so long as it doesn't cost too much, so as long as we don't have to change ourselves or our lifestyles too much, as long as we don't have to question our basic attitudes or assumptions about work or money or anything else. Leo Tolstoy has a quote, I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me, and yet assure myself and others that I am very sorry for him and wish to ease his lot by any means possible, except getting off his back. So, we need to get off the back of the, uh, of the earth, we need to stop the things that we've been doing, and we need to change directions. And these are some of the directions of my organization, Commonway Institute for Societal Transformation. Awakening, reawakening to the sacred that we should stop this soul starvation of our society. And by the way, I'm not advocating for religion, I'm advocating for spirituality. Praxis, which is a fancy Latin word for practicing the new society. Restructuring, dismantling, repurposing, or reconfiguring existing systems and structures. Emergence, birthing a new society, creating, recreating the commons. And vision, vision setting in our turbulent times. I think that that is the way that we can get ourselves out of the mess that we're in right now. I believe that there is a sacred pattern that's emerging on our planet right now. I believe that it's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult birth, but something new is being born. I believe that we have a choice. I believe that our choice is to evolve with this or cling to the status quo, hang on to the Titanic as it goes down. I think that our lives, our fortune depends on that. I think that creating a world that works for all is an idea that's worth spreading. And I hope you join me in that. Thank you.